Good afternoon. I'm Councilman David O, and welcome to Launching and Sustaining New Nonprofits. This is a uh, workshop on how to form a nonprofit organization presented by Fleming Patenko Law. Um, our presenters, Noel Fleming and Casey Patenko, um, specialize in the field of nonprofit um, law as well as uh, tax exempt organizations. Uh, this workshop will be an hour and uh, it should um, provide steps you should follow to form nonprofit organization and obtain tax exempt status. It will also discuss good corporate governance. The topics covered will include the difference between tax exempt and nonprofit, the types of entities that qualify for tax exemption, the steps to form a nonprofit organization, how to apply for tax exemption, what corporate governance is and best practices and potential pitfalls. So with that, let me hand it off to Noel Fleming and Casey Patenko to introduce themselves uh, and to begin our workshop. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Noel Fleming, um, one half of Fleming Vitenko Law. So um, we specialize in representing nonprofit organizations of all shapes and sizes. Um, we've been doing this for quite a while. And so um, we, we just help, we, we don't um, focus on any one particular type of nonprofit, but handle all sorts of their compliance and transactional needs. And I'll pass it over to Casey to introduce herself. Hello, I'm Casey Patenko, the other half of Fleming Patenko Law. Um, and as Noel said, we work exclusively with nonprofits. And so um, as we start this presentation and afterwards, feel free to reach out to us. Our contact information is on the last slide um, with any questions that you might have. And hopefully we have an answer for you. So with that, um, Councilman O pretty much covered this, but a quick review of our agenda. First, we're gonna start with an overview of the nonprofit arena. So we sort of know what we're talking about contextually. Then we'll talk about how to form a nonprofit, how to apply to get tax exempt status for that nonprofit. We'll touch on good corporate governance, and then we're gonna finish with some liability protections for directors and officers and for volunteers. Um, we know there's going to be a lot of information to cover, so we intentionally put a little bit more information on the slides than we'll be able to cover today that way so um, everyone can go back and look at it later. And again, um, please stop us at any point. Feel free to interrupt with those questions. So looking at nonprofit versus tax exempt, before you're forming a new entity, the first question that you should ask a person is whether or not they've considered if they want to form a nonprofit versus a for-profit. And so some questions in this arena are going to be, um, what is the purpose of this organization? Are you trying to maximize profits or are you trying to further some sort of social or charitable goal? Will the organization be providing goods and services at market prices, at a discount for free? Um, and then any profits, are they going to be reinvested or distributed? And so just some things for people to, to think about before they actually go down that nonprofit route. And when we use this term nonprofit, this is actually a state law term and so the organization is formed as a nonprofit under state law. And then to be tax exempt, they have to apply to the IRS. There are a handful of organizations that don't actually have to qualify, but generally speaking, they all do. And then to become tax exempt, not only do you have to apply, but the organization has to meet certain eligibility requirements. And the same is often true um, at the state and local level. So looking at um, the state level versus the federal level, when um, your organization is formed in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Attorney General's Office is going to oversee it and can take action against the nonprofit on behalf of its beneficiaries who are typically the public. And then there are gonna be certain actions that a Pennsylvania nonprofit organization need to get approved by the Pennsylvania Orphans Court before they can do them. So this might include changing the terms of a trust agreement 
or dissolving the organization if they have assets greater than $1,000. And having tax exempt status at the state level means that you'll be exempt from most state income taxes. You could potentially have um, an exemption from property tax and sales and use tax, and then also some local level taxes. From the federal level perspective, the IRS is gonna be the governing agency that is gonna oversee this tax exempt entity. And from the federal level, you'll be exempt from some or all federal income taxes. And we'll touch on the some part of that a little bit later. So section 501C of the Internal Revenue Code is where we go to look at what type of organization you are. And currently there are 28 types of organizations listed here, but only 501C three organizations can receive tax deductible contributions. So we, we think of these as sort of the gold standard of these organizations. And we've listed some of the other ones that um, you might see frequently, just so you know what they might be. And as I said, 501c3 are those charitable organizations. C4s are civic leagues. These are not quite charitable, but they are operated exclusively for the promotion of social benefit. C6 organizations are um, trade associations, chambers of commerce, or business leagues. And then C7s are social clubs. So this would be a country club or the union league, for example. So when your, your organization is deciding if they want to get tax exempt status or not, there are definitely pros and cons to consider before taking that um, plunge. So on the, on the advantages side, you, as I mentioned, can get that exemption from um, some or all federal and state income, income taxes. Um, and one of the exceptions here is if your organization has um, unrelated business income, you might have to pay tax on that. So it's just something to be aware of. Once you have tax exempt status, the organization can also receive those tax deductible contributions. Um, and have access to certain funding. So this might include tax exempt bond proceeds. You could get funding from private foundations. And sometimes donors um, who are looking for that tax deduction will only donate to 501c3 organizations. Also, it's necessary if you're looking for those state and local level exemptions, it's necessary to have your 501c3 status. And the last thing is you just have this halo effect. So your organization looks good. Um, it looks a little bit more legitimate if someone's looking to give funds to your cause. However, that being said, there are some disadvantages. There's um, a time and money commitment to form your organization and obtain that tax exempt status. There's also time and money commitment for um, retaining that tax exempt status. So you have maintenance you have to do each year. Um, Having status means that your organization is now going to have these additional restrictions on what you can and can't do, and you're going to have public disclosure of certain pieces of information, such as um, compensation to people, um, relationships between members of your governing board and the organization. And so the big goal with 501c3 status is transparency. And sometimes people just don't want to provide that transparency. So in that case, it wouldn't be right for them. So we provide this as um, a graphic just so we know what we're talking about in terms of nonprofits and where they fit into the scheme of things. So in this outer circle, we're talking about all of those organizations that have been formed at the state level as a nonprofit. And in Pennsylvania, we call it a nonprofit. Some other states might call it a not for profit. It doesn't matter. They're all the same thing. It's just how you're organized. The next circle in are those um, different types of C3, 4, 5, 6, all of them. And then we jump one circle in, and it's those gold standard 501c3 organizations. Within 501c3, there are different classifications that your organization can be, whether it's a public charity or a private foundation. And then within those two categories, there are further um, ways to be broken down. So it's just helpful to be aware that there are these different classifications. Now, I'll pass it on to Noel. <laughs> 
Thanks, Casey. So in this next section, we'll talk about the actual process of forming a nonprofit corporation under state law. And as Casey mentioned, there's sort of two big uh, pieces to this. You know, you form your nonprofit under state law first, and then um, we'll talk a little bit later about how that nonprofit itself has to obtain tax exempt status by applying to the IRS for that status. So um, in this section, um, first thing you might want to think about is forming a nonprofit. What type of entity? What's the choice of entity that you might want to use? We list here a bunch of different entities um, that potentially are available, although not all of these would actually qualify when you get to the IRS um, portion of applying for tax exempt status. So. Um, I won't go through all of them because we um, we really have a lot of information um, in the presentation, so we're going to skip over some of this fairly quickly. But for today's presentation, we're going to focus on the corporate entities. So nonprofit corporations are really um, the the standard in in the um, IRS world for obtaining tax exempt status. You can have trusts, you can even have unincorporated associations, but for liability protection and for other reasons, a nonprofit corporation is the entity that most people choose nowadays. Before you actually form the entity, we have a question here at the bottom. Do you even need an entity? And on the next slide here, we're going to look at potential options to whether you need an entity. So the first is whether um, maybe you can avail of something called fiscal sponsorship. So when someone has a, has a already, they might already have an entity formed, but they don't have tax exempt status yet, they can um, partner with an existing 501c3 that has a purpose that's somewhat similar to the new organization's purpose. And the existing ent entity can act as a fiscal sponsor, meaning that they can attract charitable contributions and use those contributions to support the project, which would be this, the project that your, your organization potentially um, is pursuing. And so this is an alternative to actually going through the whole process that Casey mentioned about um, obtaining tax exempt status, which has a time cost and a resources cost. So um, you will see some organizations do this as an initial step to see whether they can get traction and really should be a tax exempt organization. Um, and some organizations stay in this phase for a long time. As an additional option on the next slide, we're gonna look at, um, mention real quick about donor advised funds. Okay, donor advised fund is a set, is a part of an existing nonprofit corporation that sponsors funds. So if I wanna um, do charitable work, but I don't want the hassle of having a whole new entity that I've gotta have a board of directors for, and I've gotta make sure I comply with all sorts of rules each year, I may wanna to go to one of these potentially a community foundation or what they call a commercial donor advised fund sponsor, which are all nonprofits. And maybe I create the Fleming Patenko donor advised fund there. Now, when I do that, I have to I contribute my money that I was going to use for my project. Um, and that money then technically belongs to the community foundation, but they will listen to our advice as to how we want those funds spent in supporting charitable activities. So it's another option. It's usually available and used by more wealthy donors um, that don't want to start a private foundation, but we just wanted to put it in the slide material so you have that available at your fingertips. So let's assume you're not going to take one of those. Before we actually pull the trigger on forming a nonprofit, I wanted to really touch base about this corporate hierarchy and explain this issue of members. So um, we, we list here members, and I'll talk about this on this slide and maybe on the next slide. Um, this sort of shows in, um, graphically what the corporate structure might look like. If you have members, which I will, I will talk about in the next slide, members really are, are equivalent or similar to shareholders, with some big exceptions, to, of a for-profit. So members would be the um, individuals, organizations that may appoint the board of directors. Once the board is appointed, the board is responsible and oversees um, the general running of the organization and appoints if it needs to a CEO or executive director who then is responsible for the staff. Um, from the board of directors, we have um, those arrows showing that board of directors often rely on committees and committees can be very useful and helpful to boards um, and the, officer, the officers of the organization as well support uh, the board of directors and help the board make sure that it is supervising the organization and ensuring that it's pursuing the charitable purposes correctly. Um, on the next slide, this is just, I mentioned these members. Um, members, again, are very similar to shareholders of a for-profit. However, members don't have the right to receive dividends or payments of income from the charity itself. But so what rights do members have? These are um, what we call legal members, and they're distinct from what you might think of. The example we often use is if I donate to WHYY, for example, and I get my 
lovely mug every year and I get some other knick and knickknacks. The, I am not, they call me a member, but I'm not a legal member. I don't have any rights to vote for the board of directors. So that's not the type of member we're talking about here. There's something, a distinct um, position called legal member that has certain rights, one of which is usually to appoint the board of directors. Once the board is in place, the board runs the organization. Sometimes you may have what we see on the left here is sole member. And oftentimes you'll have more than one member, um, which we see a depiction of on the right here. We're not going to get into that much more than just to mention that it's there and you should be aware of it, but um, that's why I put it on the slide. I will say on the next slide, if you do have members, you want to know like how many they are, what rights do they have? The rights are usually spelled out and the most significant one that we, we, we mentioned there is that they have the right to appoint it the board of directors. They often also have the right to approve what we call fundamental transactions. So the board is running the organization, but the board cannot take certain actions like deciding to dissolve, deciding to merge, um, deciding, deciding to get rid of most of its assets. It cannot take those kinds of trans, um, transactions without getting the approval of the members. So the members really have a lot of authority to make sure the organization is running the way they um, anticipate it should run. So these are the other provisions. Do they, um, are there different classes? Sometimes different members have different rights. Um, do they elect the board? Usually they do. This mention of private inurement is what I, I said a, a few minutes ago, that they are not entitled, even though they are sort of similar to shareholders, they're not entitled to receive dividends or income from the organization. Those funds have to be used to pursue and continue the organization's charitable purpose. Um, we're talking about control. The members have the voting, voting right over these fun, fundamental transactions. So they do have, even though they let the board of directors run the organization, if the board were to do something or try to do something, the members um, didn't agree with, the members could, in theory, remove the board and replace it with members or with, with a board of directors that um, are more in line with what the members' beliefs are. That's all we say about members for now. Um, so we've decided, we've gone through that initial phase. You know, someone's deciding whether they, they want to incorporate. You think about the type of entity they want. Do they really want an entity? Um, maybe they even want to, instead of um, incorporating a new entity, maybe they want to partner with an existing charity. If they decide to incorporate in Pennsylvania, these are the things, these, this is the information that they need to have at their fingertips. You need a registered, registered office, which can be oftentimes for new or small nonprofits, it's going to be the founder's um, home address, but you can pay for a commercial registered office in Pennsylvania, you do need that. You need a name, obviously, you wanna make sure that the name is available and there's, we list here several ways that you can check whether, whether that particular name is available. You wanna avoid, um, and this is not something that um, founders often think of at the outset, you want to avoid infringing on some trademarks. So if you have a great name and a great mission, um, just check. It's an easy to check whether you may be um, infringing on someone's trademark to check on the um, patent website here. Make sure the name is available for domain, domain names. So um, again, that's not something a lot of organizations think about. Initially, they have a great name, but when they go to see if they can set up a website, maybe that name is already taken. And we mentioned here, cons consider a fictitious name. So often you will see organizations that have a legal name, but they're doing business as another name that may be a little more catchy, um, easier to remember or something. So it's something to consider. When you are forming the nonprofit, um, it's very helpful to go to the Department of State's website that we list here. They have um, form documents for um, nonprofit corporations are to form on using their articles of incorporation. And we mentioned here that you also will need their docketing, docketing statements. So if you're forming an entity, you need to complete those documents and file them with the Department of State. On our next slide, okay, we're gonna give sort of an overview of these organizational matters. I mentioned the articles of incorporation. So to, to get the organization up and running, again, this is all under state law. You file those articles with the state agency, Pennsylvania, that's the Pennsylvania Department of State. The directors who are appointed by the initial incorporator, so let's say I'm forming the nonprofit, I'm the incorporator, I file the articles with the Department of State. Then the first thing, once those articles are approved, I wanna appoint directors. Um, so I appoint Casey and I appoint myself as directors. We then um, have, a, have a board meeting um, where we adopt the articles. We say, okay, we approve those articles. Um, we want to make sure that we then appoint officers. That in Pennsylvania, you need three off three corporate officers. You need a president, a treasurer, and a secretary. Technically, one person can serve um, in many officer roles, but we, you know, if, if possible, it's best to have a separate individual serve in each of those roles so that there's checks and balances. The 
um, directors also adopt bylaws and certain other policies. A conflict of interest policy is a very important one that should be in place from the outset because um, as Casey will mention, that's something the IRS needs when you apply to them for tax exempt status. And the directors may also want to authorize who has signature authority. So who can sign contracts, who can um, open bank accounts. And usually that's president, you know, it'll, it'll identify several people who have that authority to be able to act on behalf of the organization. Lastly, here we mentioned it's very important to obtain an employer identification number. You can go on the IRS website. The IRS has an online tool where you can obtain an, I, um, an EIN. To do that, though, you want to make sure you have already incorporated and have all the details of the organization's name, who is a responsible party for the organization. That's usually the, the principal officer, so let's say the president. Um, but once you have that information, you can get the EIN usually pretty immediately if the, if the website is working, which doesn't always, but most of the time it, it, is, um, it does work OK. So that's sort of the overview of the organizational matters to form the nonprofit. Um, we're filing the Articles of Incorporation. As I mentioned, filed with the Department of State. These are gonna describe your general legal structure. Your file is a nonprofit entity. Um, whether you have members, it's gonna reference that whole thing about membership, whether you have members. And not all, I, I might be focusing too much on members, but um, you can have them, but not all nonprofits have members by any stretch. So just, just wanna mention that. You're going to have some important restrictive provisions that need to be in these articles um, that the IRS is going to look for. So, for example, you're going to say that um, you can only conduct an insubstantial amount of lobbying. You don't have time to, today to get into what lobbying is, but you can conduct a little bit of lobbying, but it can't be its principal purpose or even a significant part of its purpose. Can't be involved in any political campaigns whatsoever. As Councilman know, knows well, um, nonprofits are not, not um, supposed to get involved in political campaigns whatsoever. Um, you must have a, a language in here that says no private inurement. So, inurement is the term we mentioned earlier where the, the organization's income and assets cannot be used to inappropriate, inappropriately benefit any um, private individual. They can be used for people who are part of the charitable class that we are trying to help but not people who are associated with the nonprofit that um, might be inappropriately benefited from that. Other language that's required for C3 purposes, you have to have a charitable purpose and you have to have a dissolution, dissolution clause that's going to say, if and when our organization is ever dissolved, the assets remaining must go to another 501C3 um, corp, nonprofit corporation. Finally, this is a little quirk that the um, Pennsylvania um, rules have. Once you file any type of entity, basically, but specifically nonprofit corporations, you need to advertise that filing in a general newspaper and a legal publication. It's a really outdated kind of um, provision, but it's still effective. It's still um, in place. So this is something that um, new organizations need to complete. And if you contact any of these newspapers, they, they know how to um, file these and make them public. So with that, we talk a um, little bit about your exempt purpose. What is a lawful nonprofit purpose? Pennsylvania um, statute allows very broad purposes. But again, we're focused on once we're filed under, under state law, we're going to apply to the IRS for exempt status. So for 501c3 purposes, you must be organized, which is what your documents say, organized for certain purposes and operated. That's how you actually conduct your operations. And here's the list from the 501c3 statute that says you can be organized for religious, charitable, scientific, testing for public safety. Um, and just know that the, the term charitable encompasses a broad range of activities. So anything that is helping um, the distressed, low income, people who are needy can be considered charitable. So again, once your purpose, once you um, know where your purpose is going to fit within this 501c3 um, regime, you will be fine making sure that's in your articles of incorporation. Um, on the next slide, we're going to talk real quick about the bylaws. So we filed the articles of incorporation and we've appointed the directors. The directors now are going to adopt bylaws and bylaws are your secondary governance and in, in document. Bylaws provide the provisions of how the organization is going to be governed. Um, if there's an inconsistency, which sometimes happens between the bylaws and what's in the articles, the articles are always going to control because that's the document that was initially filed with the state. But other than that, the bylaws are legally binding rules that regulate how the organization is operated. operated. If you have very um, limited bylaws that don't cover a lot of provisions, the, the nonprofit corporation statute has provisions in there that are going to um, govern if you don't 
if you don't provide that for that in your particular bylaws. So that's helpful in some ways because some bylaws don't have every provision under the sun and for something that's not covered in your bylaws, presumably it'll be covered in the nonprofit statute, which then will control for whatever purpose you're looking at. As we mentioned, it's not filed with the state, but it is adopted by the board of directors. Some of the content of bylaws, it's gonna talk again about membership, if they exist. Um, it'll mention whether we have committees or, or may have committees and what types of committees you may have. We'll reference limited liability and indemnification. So most nonprofit corporations have limited liability because most of their officers and at least lot, most of their directors are volunteers and therefore the statute um, will provide for limited liability. Um, it'll also talk about how the bylaws may be amended. Usually it's at least the majority of the directors will um, have to approve amendments to the bylaws. Um, and on the next slide, it may talk about rules for the board members. So how are they, what qualifications? They may have very limited qualifications, just be a resident of the state, perhaps. You're not required to be a resident, but you may um, impose that requirement. How are they elected or appointed? Is there a nomination committee? Many directors do we have? Technically in Pennsylvania, you only need one director, but when you get to, to the point of applying to the IRS, the IRS likes to see a minimum of three. So we always recommend a minimum of three directors, depending on what the organization, how what its activities are, you may want to have more than that. And most organizations do generally have more than three directors. Um, how long do they serve? What's their term? One year, two years before they're reelected? What responsibilities do they have? How are they removed? Um, and then we'll, the, the bylaws will also talk about board meetings. There should be regular board meetings, depending on your activities, at least annual, but probably more regular than that. What kind of notice provisions need to be given for meetings? And how is the voting? Usually it's by majority vote. So if you have um, 50 percent, 50 51% voting in favor of an action that will um, pass a resolution. Quorum is, is something that's interesting here because um, again, normally quorum is at least a majority of the directors in office, but always keep in mind that let's say you have um, five directors, well, three then is a quorum. If only three show up and you only need a majority of that quorum, then two directors can pass a resolution. So two out of the total of five that you have on your board could actually pass a binding resolution that's binding on all the complete, the whole board. Just something to keep in mind. Um, I'm moving quickly, I know, because we do have a lot to cover. So lastly, I'm just gonna mention here really quickly, we recommend and every nonprofit organization and for-profits should keep a minute, a minute, what we call a minutes book. And this is really just a, a binder or another um, folder that contains all the important corporate documents that a nonprofit corporation is going to have. And this is so useful. We list here, and I'm not gonna go through all the documents that we list here. These are all the important, most of the important documents that a nonprofit will have. And it's so important because for several reasons, if you are ever audited, you're gonna have a very handy um, binder which is gonna have all these documents to be able to show to the IRS. If you ever apply for a loan, you're gonna have all these documents. And if you're ever um, other regulatory bodies like the Attorney General, if they ever ask questions, it's nice to have these in one place. So we highly recommend that um, nonprofits maintain their own minutes book. With that, I am going to pass it back. We'll just, just to give you an idea of where we are, you've just formed your nonprofit corporation, you've established your board, you've adopted bylaws and other policies you may need, and now you want to obtain tax exemption status, and Casey is going to talk about that. Yes. So in order to get tax exempt status, you have to put the IRS on notice that you are seeking it. And the way that you do this is by filing one of two forms. There is the IRS form 1023, which we call the full form. And then there's the IRS form 1023-EZ, which is the shortened form. So as I mentioned before, there are certain types of organizations that don't necessarily have to file with the IRS just by um, the type that they are. So for example, a church or a religious organization, they automatically get status. That being said, we always recommend that organizations go ahead and file anyway so that they are getting the IRS's approval that they, the way that they're running their organization and the activities that they're carrying on are in fact um, eligible for tax exempt status. So um, as Noel mentioned before, in order to apply, you need to get your EIN first, your employer identification number. And you should be applying within 27 months of the formation date of the organization. And this rule comes into play because if you apply within the 27 months, once the organization gets its tax exempt status granted, 
it's retroactive to its date of formation. For organizations that apply after the 27 months, if they get their tax exempt status granted, it's only retroactive to their filing date of their 1023 or their 1023 easy. Um, and I should say the reason why that's important, if it's retroactive to your formation date, then that means whatever um, contribution the organization received from its formation date up until the point that it got its tax exempt status granted will then be tax deductible. And once you get your tax exempt status granted, you'll get a determination letter, which I will talk about momentarily. So looking at the short form first, the 1023 EZ, this was launched in 2014, and it was designed to streamline and simplify the process. So only certain types of organizations are going to be eligible to use this 1023 easy form. And so there is an eligibility worksheet that organizations should complete first that will tell them whether or not they are eligible to use the form. So typically it's um, organizations that are expected to have gross receipts less than 50,000 in each of their first years and organizations whose total assets have a fair market value of less than 250,000. So for organizations that have already um, been operating, the $50,000 threshold would be for your last three years of operations. So there are a number of other requirements, but um, for organizations that fit into this, they can file this 1023 EZ. Um, as I said before, it's a shortened form, so it's only three pages. There's no attachments, so you're not, even though you have to have those articles and bylaws, you're not attaching them to the application. And so it's basically just asking you to self-certify that the organization qualifies for tax exempt status. Um, a question that has come up frequently is what happens if you say you're going to um, have less than 50000 and then in year two you get a large donation that puts you over the top. And that's fine. It's just at the time that you're applying, you have to make this um, good faith estimate of what you reasonably expect the organization to be getting. So the processing time for this application is about one to three months. And the organization, I mean, the IRS might come back to the organization and ask for additional information. So that could delay the process a little bit. Um, the filing fee for this one is $275. And this application, along with the 1023 as well now, has to be completed and paid for online at the IRS's pay.gov website. So the benefits of this is it can definitely save time and money, um, but there's also a large opportunity for organizations to make mistakes or have their organization improperly classified. And so that's why sometimes we recommend doing the full 1023, which I'll talk about in a second, just because it's a good exercise for the organization to really think about their activities and what they plan on doing. So for those organizations who can't file the 1023 easy, they have to file this full 1023. And it asks for a significant amount of detailed information about your um, the organization's governance, its activities. And it, it can take a good amount of time to assemble this application. So some of the highlights of what they're looking for um, is a narrative description of the organization's activities. So this is asking about past, present, and future activities. So what is the organization doing? How does it satisfy the organization's exempt purposes? And it also asks for detailed financial information with both um, financials of years that have already occurred, but then estimates or budgets for future years. And part of that is because they're trying to figure out if your organization would be classified as a public charity or a private foundation. So this application does require attachments. You have to attach those governing documents, so your articles, your bylaws. Um, it asks if you have that conflict of interest policy. It asks for um, if you have completed years already for copies of your financials. Um, and sometimes you also have to complete, based on the type of organization you are or the activities you're gonna do, certain schedules, which then would also be included. So this one um, generally takes four to six months. We are definitely seeing a longer um, 
wait period, I think due to the, the beginning of the pandemic just so happened to align with when this form went electronic. And so that sped it up, but now um, it, it's, it's slowed down a bit. And the filing fee for this one is $600. And as I said, you also have to use the pay.gov website for this form. So once the IRS reviews the application and is granting tax exempt status for the organization, you'll receive a letter called the determination letter. Um, it's going to tell you the effective date of the um, exempt status, the classification of the organization, and the type. So if you're a private foundation or a public charity, and then within that, what your classification would be. And this exempt status granting is based on whatever was submitted on your 1023 or 1023 easy. So if you have that status, it's based on what you said you're going to do. So if you ever decide to change your purpose or your activities, um, it, it's not like a, a blanket to just do whatever. And something helpful is that um, you can go online to the IRS's website and there's a tool where you can either use the EIN or the organization's name to look up if they have this tax exempt status and for some of their records. So now that you have tax exempt status, there's um, several things that organizations have to do in order to maintain that status. So the first big one, um, from a federal perspective, you have to file an annual information return. Um, for organizations that have gross receipts normally less than 50,000, they can file what is, it's a 990N, but it's referred to as the e-postcard. It's only filed online. It's a very quick form um, and you're just certifying to a couple of items. For organizations that are a little bit bigger, but have gross receipts less than 200,000 and assets less than 500,000, they can file a 990EZ form. So it's, it's a little bit more um, in depth, but not as much as the full 990. So then all organizations are, are eligible to file the 990, but specifically ones that have gross receipts greater than or equal to 200,000 or assets greater than or equal to 500,000 um, have to file this 990 form. And for if an organization is classified as a private foundation, they're going to be filing what's called the 990 PF form. So we said sometimes organizations are going to be exempt from all or some of their federal income tax. And in those cases where it's just some, if an organization has generated $1,000 or more of gross unrelated business income, they have a tax that they have to pay. So they're gonna be filing this additional form called a 990T. So these forms are due the 15th day of the fifth month after the close of the organization's tax year. For calendar year filers, that's May 15th. For June 30th fiscal year ends, that's November 15th. However, there is this automatic six month extension that's available for anybody filing a 990, a 990EZ or a 990T. And the biggest takeaway from this portion of the federal um, maintenance is that if an organization fails to file one of these returns for three consecutive years, it will automatically have its tax exempt status revoked. And that's a huge deal. And a lot of organizations don't even realize that they've had their status revoked for failure to file. So definitely emphasize this to anyone who's going to be forming a nonprofit. At the state level, there are several requirements on an annual basis as well. For organizations that are gonna be soliciting funds within the state of Pennsylvania, they are required to register for charitable solicitation registration. Um, in Pennsylvania specifically, there is a threshold um, until you raise 25,000 nationally or hire someone to solicit on behalf of your organization, you don't have to register. Uh, but each state has their own requirements. So even if you're a Pennsylvania organization, if you are soliciting in New Jersey, for example, they have a $10,000 threshold. So it's just important to know before an organization goes out there asking for money. And then Pennsylvania, we also have an annual statement that needs to be filed each year if there's a change of the organization's officers. 
And we also have a unique filing called a decennial filing, which um, is filed on every 10 years and years ending in one. So it happens to be a decennial year, um, something else that organizations don't happen to know a lot about. So this is, this is the year to file a lot. And now I'll pass it back to Noel to talk about what is corporate governance and good corporate governance. Awesome. Um, yeah, so now we're at the stage where you've formed your nonprofit, you've applied and obtained tax exempt status. Um, so we wanna make sure that the organization is operating appropriately and following state law um, governance rules. So um, under, under Pennsylvania and every state, directors are fiduciaries of the organization. And that means they are required to act in the best interest of the organization. And we'll talk in a second about the three primary fiduciary duties that directors have. And these are legal requirements that are imposed on directors. So as you mentioned, the board's the governing body and it's so with the board's responsible for the bigger picture items, you know, what is the organization's mission, organization's mission, how it is, how is it going to obtain and pursue and obtain that mission, um, make sure it uses its resources in the proper manner um, and make sure the organization complies with all laws, local, state and federal laws. Even though we say here no director has the authority to act alone, directors, the board is, a, is supposed to be a collegial body, it's supposed to act um, as a group, um, but even though they're not able not able to act alone, each director has a separate and independent fiduciary duty. So the three duties are the duty of care, the duty of loyalty, and the duty of obedience. We'll talk about those um, over the next three slides. So the duty of care. Directors have to act in good faith, use them um, with the care an ordinarily prudent person would use in similar circumstances. So what does that mean? That really means directors must attend meetings and read the materials. They must be prepared. They must um, know what the organization is doing. They must take steps to understand what the organization is doing. They don't have to be experts on, on nonprofit fin financials or anything else, but they should read the financials um, when they're provided to them or make sure they're provided to them. They should ask questions. So. Um, that's the biggest issue we sometimes come across is that directors may not understand something, but they, they don't um, speak up and ask questions to, to get a better understanding. Um, and, and then they can make decisions based on their own independent judgment, not basing their decisions on the opinion or necessarily the judgment of others. Having said that, there is a special provision in the statute that allows directors, so long as they have um, you know, put the right um, thought into their decision, they can rely on information that um, from other individuals or people that um, they believe have the, has the requisite knowledge. So for example, if there's a lawyer on the board and there's a legal question comes up and that lawyer happens to know the answer to that question, um, the directors can say, okay, that sounds reasonable and I will base my decision on what I've heard there because uh, based on everything else and the whole facts and circumstances, that's reasonable. So you can use expertise of others to make your decision, but you must at least um, be aware of what you are deciding on and read and review all the documents that are um, re related to that. The second duty of care is the duty of loyalty. And this essentially means that the directors must not um, take an opportunity away from the organization and must act in the best interest of the organization at all times, not their own self-interest. So if, um, if a director is providing services to the organization, which is a conflict of interest, um, it can happen so long as the organization itself um, has asked the director to provide those services the organization has reviewed the arrangement and said, um, you know, for whatever reason, maybe the, the director is providing those services at a cheaper rate than they can get elsewhere. Maybe they're better services than they can get elsewhere. But the independent board members have decided that is a relationship they want to get involved in. Um, so long as it's done the proper way, it's OK sometimes to have those kinds of relationships. But if a director is um, using, for example, his own insurance company, um, is providing services and no one else is aware, that's a direct conflict of interest and a breach potentially of this duty of loyalty because the organization um, is buying services from somebody potentially that um, maybe it's not a great deal and the, all, the, all the facts and circumstances have not been disclosed. So the duty of loyalty is making sure that you act in the best interest of the organization at all times when you're acting as a director, keeping information confident, confidential and not using it for your own personal gain. We say here talking about um, avoiding conflicts of interest. Generally, you avoid them, but if you do have something where you may have a conflict of interest, as I just mentioned, the director must disclose that to the organization and independent directors, uh, that is directors who do not have any relationship to that transaction, must approve it, approve that transaction if the organization wanters, wants to enter into it with the director. <laughs> 
The last duty, um, fiduciary duty we have is the duty of obedience. And this just means that directors must ensure the organization is fulfilling its mission and is complying with all federal, state and local laws. Um, again, if the organization, we recommend certain policies for the organization, especially a conflict of interest policy, it may have a document and destruction policy, um, all sorts of other policies that we'll actually mention in a little bit. If they have those policies, it's great, but they must ensure that they're actually following the policies and acting in accordance with them, because if they're not, then they may be violating this duty of obedience. And what's important about these three duties is that if a director um, intentionally violates one of these duties, they may get themselves in and maybe subject to some personal liability. So it's very important that they always act in the best interest of the organization using their own skills and being prepared for meetings and to make decisions. On the next slide, um, okay, to, first line of defense um, to, to help the organization be effective and efficient is having the right internal controls and procedures. Conflict of interest policies are basically required by the IRS before you can get your tax exempt status. And that's just gonna outline the basis on which um, directors and other related individuals must identify to the organization if they have a transaction or arrangement that may be in conflict with the organization. As I said in the last slide, it's not necessarily an actual conflict if they disclose it to the organization, independent directors approve the transaction because for whatever reason, it's in the best interest of the organization to have that transaction, um, and then it's documented. If it's all those th procedures are followed, then the conflict, the potential conflict may be allowed. Whistleblower policies also can protect the organization from all sorts of um, lawsuits, document retention, destruction policy. So we go through a whole list here of policies that not every organization is going to need. Um, some of the larger organizations may need most of these, but depending on your actual activities, you, your organization may want to consider um, having these policies in place. But they're also, we like to think of them as the first line of defense to protect the organization and the individual directors if they have these policies and actually follow them, that they will help them in the event there are lawsuits or other issues are brought up. And speaking of lawsuits and potential liability, Casey's going to talk a little bit about the protections we have. Thanks. So typically, as Noel mentioned before, we're going to have limitation of liability and indemnification provisions located in the organization's bylaws. However, in addition to that, also as Noel mentioned, these are these are some of those default provisions that are in the Pennsylvania nonprofit statute. So if the bylaws don't have them, sometimes the statute can kick in. Um, in terms of limitation of liability, if you are a director and an officer and you're serving on a nonprofit board, you want to know that if somebody were to sue the nonprofit, that you're not going to be held personally liable for um, this lawsuit against the organization. So the statute language says that the directors and officers will not be held personally liable for actions taken or not taken to the fullest extent possible. And so while this is not a blanket um, limitation of liability, the directors and officers still have to be acting in the best interest of the organization, still have to be complying with those fiduciary duties. What it's saying is if you're serving as a director and you're um, making those decisions based on your own judgment that you think are the best decisions and it maybe turns out to not be the best um, action taken, you're still not gonna be held personally liable. And in terms of indemnification, this is important because even if you're not found to be personally liable, you still have, you still might have to go to court and defend yourself and say that you aren't, you have this limitation of liability. And so indemnification will kick in and it will provide that the nonprofit corporation will indemnify directors and officers to the full extent possible. Again, in those situations where the director or officer was acting in the best interest of the nonprofit and wasn't doing anything um, intentionally to hurt the organization. And so um, part of indemnification, if you're a director or an officer, you're gonna wanna make sure that it includes the advancement of expenses for those things. Because if you are entitled to indemnification, you don't want to be the one footing a legal bill, for example, and then waiting for the organization to then reimburse you later. And so this is, these two are a particularly good tool in terms of recruiting new board members 
because me personally, if I served on a nonprofit board, I'm not going to serve on one that that isn't going to provide me with these additional protections. So another um, tool that we recommend um, nonprofit organizations have is this what's called DNO insurance, directors and officers insurance. And it's basically a policy that's going to step in and protect the organization and the board in circumstances that might not be covered by a general liability policy. And um, an important benefit, as the slide says, is that broad coverage for employment related claims. However, when you're a board member and you're looking at different DNO policies for the organization, there's going to be several questions that you're going to want to ask. So who exactly is covered by the policy? Is it just directors? Um, are officers included? Does it happen to include any staff? Um, in what situations does this actually kick in? And is there a limitation on the coverage? Can you expand that limitation? And last, again, that advancing of expenses, is that included? Because that's a very important one. And um, DNO insurance is another one that's a big draw when you're trying to get new board members um, on board. And you can look at a nonprofit organization's bylaws and it will say whether or not they have to get DNO insurance or just if they can get DNO insurance. And then the last thing that we're going to mention in terms of liability protection is there's this law called the Volunteer Protection Act, and it provides um, limited immunity for volunteers. So that would include directors and officers serving on nonprofit boards, um, but it doesn't prevent lawsuits against them. And so the, the clear distinction here is that it does not provide protection in certain cases like employment related acts, um, whereas the DNO insurance is going to kick in to protect against those situations. And um, the employment related lawsuits happen to be the most common for nonprofits, and that would include harassment or discrimination. So it's good to have both the DNO insurance and this Volunteer Protection Act. And so this Protection Act will kick in and provide immunity. Um, when a volunteer is acting within the scope of their responsibilities or the duties of their position. And again, if they're not doing anything malicious or reckless to harm the organization. So it's just good to know that if you're a director and an officer serving on a nonprofit board, you do have multiple avenues of liability protection. And with that, we are done, but we are certainly available if there are any questions. We covered a lot, so um, we moved fast in some places, but I'm sure um, if you have questions, we're happy to answer them now, or you can follow up with us directly at our contact information. All right, well, thank you. That that was uh, very thorough <laughs> and, and um, concise. Uh, so we appreciate all of that. I'm gonna ask um, if anyone has questions, uh, if you want, you could use the chat feature or I'm gonna give you a second if you just wanna shout out, hey, I've got a question, let me give it a little bit of time. If you do, uh, don't feel like you have to have a question if you don't have a question to ask. So let's give it a little bit of time. Oh, a question, if I may. Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the presentation, it was really comprehensive. I have a specific question about the docketing sta statement. It says that you have to um, uh, uh, write who's gonna be the, that responsible party, would it be the person like like one that would be the calling the founder, or who who is just we're in the middle of this process and we don't know who's gonna be that person or should be a person, and also in the connection of liability, we don't know if we do it and then when we have to file the, the initial tax reports, something happens and then we got sued, so we we don't know the process pretty well. If you will explain us a little bit more about it, it will be great. So for the docketing statement, um, the responsible person is usually the principal officer or who's going to be the principal officer, if you know, which oftentimes might be the founder. I don't know if that's the situation in your case. Um, 
for the docketing statement. Are you, but, um, and also for the EIN, I don't know if um, that's also required, the IRS asks for that when you apply for the EIN, who the responsible person is. And they just want to know that there's somebody out there. They don't, it's not like they can, they can come after anyone, but they want to know it's not like a shell entity that somebody's setting up. They want to know there's a real life person and they have to provide for the IRS, you have to provide that person's social security number. So they know it is a, is someone they can contact. But does that answer your question? It's usually is the principal officer person who will be the principal officer or president. Or... All right. Thank you. Just yeah, also the connection with the you know, liability of doing that. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The liability. Um, I, I don't so long it was so long as they're listed well if they're listed as principal officer and they are then actually involved with the organization, right? So they are the president or executive director of the organization. They they have the same we covered about how they, they you may have liability if you're not acting within the best interests of your organization, but if you are following the rules and okay. um, taking steps that you believe are are in the best interest of the organization, you should be covered under the liability provisions that Casey talked about there at the end. Um now does, does, does that help? I mean, do you mean yes, if yes, something- Yes, that helps me a lot to understand If this. the organization does something that they didn't know about and they, you know, they're not responsible for something if, if um, someone else does something that they had no control over, they shouldn't have individual liability for that. Yeah, it's just the first says responsible, no? And that work will be strong, you know? It's just like, oh, you're responsible yeah. for the tax, or the whole, for the whole team, for the whole organization, so. Thank I think again, that. it's the same reasoning that they want to know that there is somebody associated with the organization who um, is is responsible, but has you know um, is is making sure the organization is supposed to be acting the way it should be. All right. Thank you very much. Sure. All right. Do we have any other questions? Well, that being the case, let me thank um, Noel Fleming and Casey uh, Patenko for this uh, very, very informative workshop. If anyone has questions, uh, you can contact them uh, via email um, or by telephone. Uh, that's listed on the last slide. Uh, they have been kind enough to be presenters at our annual Youth Nonprofit Symposium and uh, we hope to have them back as well. Uh, you know, in today's environment, unfortunately, it's becoming ever more a lot of folks uh, that are not able to give and a lot of folks that are able to give and a lot of people who are doing work, they just don't have the financial base anymore from, you know, friends and uh, things are getting complicated. So a lot of folks nowadays are really looking at forming legal entities uh, you know, nonprofit uh, corporations or nonprofit entities, but it can be pretty complicated and there are reporting requirements and other things. I'll just let, let you both know that I, as an elected official, am astounded by the ethics violations that pile up simply by being an elected official that wants to help a nonprofit. And we just got a whole new list. So nowadays, it's just better not to have a elected official uh, on your board trying to raise money. It's good to have an elected official trying to raise money for you, but not being on your board. It's just, you know, there's more and more ethics violations. And so, you know, everybody needs to know what you're, you're doing. And of course, you know, um, if you're trying to raise money, which everybody needs um, nowadays, you know, if you're not a uh, nonprofit entity uh, taxes exempt, it gets very difficult for that to happen. And especially with if you're looking at um, online donations and things like that, as, as uh, uh, both Casey and Noel mentioned, there is a thing like Halo or Gold Standard. People look for that because they may not know exactly who you are, but if you're, a, for example, a 501c3, they feel a lot more comfortable making that online contribution um, and the good news is a lot of people are giving and because of social media, there's a lot of folks who you might not reach otherwise who will support your cause, but you do need to be um, a 501c3 or one of those entities in order to take advantage of that. So, you know, I get contacted like with a lot of questions and while I'm an attorney, I am not a nonprofit tax exempt attorney. This is outside of my bailiwick. I would really recommend for folks who are trying to do this to talk to an expert. We have two adjunct professors who are uh, well-respected 
um, leaders in this field. So feel free to contact them. You can see they're easy to talk to. They know what they're talking about. Uh, it is not worth going down this route to run into problems that will just be very difficult or to try to raise money that you can't raise. So with that, I'll thank uh, you know Fleming Patenko and everyone for joining our call. And we look forward to talking with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.